Welcome to today's Triple Z. The Triple Z Podcast is a daily program that you can use to help you fall asleep each night. Just turn down the volume, lay back, relax, and enjoy as you fall asleep. The War of the Worlds is a science fiction novel written by H.G. Wells, first published in 1898. It is one of Wells' most famous works and is considered a classic of the science fiction genre. The story is about an alien invasion of Earth by Martians, and it has been adapted into various forms of media over the years, including movies, radio broadcasts, and television shows. It is not only a thrilling science fiction adventure, but also a commentary on the vulnerability of human civilization and the dangers of unchecked technological advancement. It explores themes of survival, the unpredictability of the natural world, and the clash between different species. If you enjoy our program, please be sure to write us a review on your podcast platform and share us with a friend you both might sleep just a little better at night. Our website is triple Z, that's three Z's dot media. You can also like and share our content on Facebook or our Instagram account ZZZ Media Podcast. Music for today's episode was provided by the Sleep Channel on Spotify. For dot the death of the curate. It was on the sixth day of our imprisonment that I peeped for the last time and presently found myself alone. Instead of keeping close to me and trying to house me from the slit, the curate had gone back into the scullery. I was struck by a sudden thought. I went back quickly and quietly into the scullery. In the darkness, I heard the curate drinking. I snatched in the darkness and my fingers caught a bottle of burgundy. For a few minutes there was a tussle. The bottle struck the floor and broke, and I desisted and rose. We stood panting and threatening each other. In the end I planted myself between him and the food and told him of my determination to begin a discipline. I divided the food in the pantry into rations to last us ten days. I would not let him eat any more that day. In the afternoon he made a feeble effort to get at the food. I had been dozing, but in an instant I was awake. All day and all night we sat face to face, I weary but resolute, and he weeping and complaining of his immediate hunger. It was, I know, a night and a day, but to me it seemed, it seems now, an interminable length of time. And so our widened incompatibility ended at last in open conflict. For two vast days we struggled in undertones and wrestling contests. There were times when I beat and kicked him madly, times when I cajoled and persuaded him, and once I tried to bribe him with the last bottle of burgundy, for there was a rainwater pump from which I could get water. But neither force nor kindness availed, he was indeed beyond reason. He would neither desist from his attacks on the food nor from his noisy babbling to himself. The rudimentary precautions to keep our imprisonment endurable he would not observe. Slowly I began to realize the complete overthrow of his intelligence to perceive that my sole companion in this close and sickly darkness was a man insane. From certain vague memories I am inclined to think my own mind wandered at times. I had strange and hideous dreams whenever I slept. It sounds paradoxical, but I am inclined to think that the weakness and insanity of the curate warned me, braced me, and kept me a sane man. On the eighth day he began to talk aloud instead of whispering, and nothing I could do would moderate his speech. It is just, oh God, he would say, over and over again. It is just. On me and mine be the punishment laid. We have sinned, we have fallen short. There was poverty, sorrow, the poor were trodden in the dust, and I held my peace. I preached acceptable folly, my God, what folly, 
why I should have stood up, though I die for it, and called upon them to repent, repent. Oppressors of the poor and needy, the wine press of God. Then he would suddenly revert to the matter of the food I withheld from him, praying, begging, weeping, at last threatening. He began to raise his voice, I prayed him not to. He perceived a hold on me, he threatened he would shout and bring the Martians upon us. For a time that scared me, but any concession would have shortened our chance of escape beyond estimating. I defied him, although I felt no assurance that he might not do this thing. But that day, at any rate, he did not. He talked with his voice rising slowly through the greater part of the eighth and ninth days, threats, entreaties, mingled with a torrent of half-sane and always frothy repentance for his vacant sham of God's service, such as made me pity him. Then he slept a while and began again with renewed strength, so loudly that I must needs make him desist. Be still. I implored. He rose to his knees, for he had been sitting in the darkness near the copper. I have been still too long, he said, in a tone that must have reached the pit, and now I must bear my witness. Woe unto this unfaithful city. Woe. 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 To the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet. Shut up. I said, rising to my feet, and in a terror lest the Martians should hear us. For God's sake. Nay, shouted the curate at the top of his voice, standing likewise and extending his arms. Speak. The word of the Lord is upon me. In three strides he was at the door leading into the kitchen. I must bear my witness. I go. It has already been too long delayed. I put out my hand and felt the meat chopper hanging to the wall. In a flash, I was after him. I was fierce with fear. Before he was halfway across the kitchen, I had overtaken him. With one last touch of humanity, I turned the blade back and struck him with the butt. He went headlong forward and lay stretched on the ground. I stumbled over him and stood panting. He lay still. Suddenly I heard a noise without, the run and smash of slipping plaster and the triangular aperture in the wall was darkened. I looked up and saw the lower surface of a handling machine coming slowly across the hole. One of its gripping limbs curled amid the debris, another limb appeared, feeling its way over the fallen beams. I stood petrified, staring. Then I saw through a sort of glass plate near the edge of the body the face, as we may call it, and the large dark eyes of a Martian, peering, and then a long metallic snake of tentacle came feeling slowly through the hole. I turned by an effort, stumbled over the curate, and stopped at the scullery door. The tentacle was now some way, two yards or more, in the room and twisting and turning with queer sudden movements this way and that. For a while I stood fascinated by that slow, fitful advance. Then, with a faint, hoarse cry, I forced myself across the scullery. I trembled violently, I could scarcely stand upright. I opened the door of the coal cellar and stood there in the darkness staring at the faintly lit doorway into the kitchen and listening. Had the Martian seen me? What was it doing now? Something was moving to and fro there, very quietly, every now and then it tapped against the wall or started on its movements with a faint metallic ringing like the movements of keys on a split ring. Then a heavy body, I knew too well what, was dragged across the floor of the kitchen towards the opening. Irresistibly attracted, I crept to the door and peeped into the kitchen. 
In the triangle of bright outer sunlight, I saw the Martian, in its briarius of a handling machine, scrutinizing the curate's head. I thought at once that it would infer my presence from the mark of the blow I had given him. I crept back to the coal cellar, shut the door, and began to cover myself up as much as I could and as noiselessly as possible in the darkness among the firewood and coal therein. Every now and then I paused, rigid, to hear if the Martian had thrust its tentacles through the opening again. Then the faint metallic jingle returned. I traced it slowly feeling over the kitchen. Presently I heard it nearer, in the scullery, as I judged. I thought that its length might be insufficient to reach me. I prayed copiously. It passed, scraping faintly across the cellar door. An age of almost intolerable suspense intervened, then I heard it fumbling at the latch. It had found the door. The Martians understood doors. It worried at the catch for a minute, perhaps, and then the door opened. In the darkness, I could just see the thing, like an elephant's trunk more than anything else, waving towards me and touching and examining the wall, coals, wooden ceiling. It was like a black worm swaying its blind head to and fro. Once, even, it touched the heel of my boot. I was on the verge of screaming. I bit my hand. For a time, the tentacle was silent. I could have fancied it had been withdrawn. Presently, with an abrupt click, it gripped something. I thought it had me and seemed to go out of the cellar again. For a minute, I was not sure. Apparently, it had taken a lump of coal to examine. I seized the opportunity of slightly shifting my position, which had become cramped, and then listened. I whispered passionate prayers for safety. Then I heard the slow, deliberate sound creeping towards me again. Slowly, slowly it drew near, scratching against the walls and tapping the furniture. While I was still doubtful, it rapped smartly against the cellar door and closed it. I heard it go into the pantry, and the biscuit tins rattled and a bottle smashed, and then came a heavy bump against the cellar door then silence that passed into an infinity of suspense. Had it gone? At last I decided that it had. It came into the scullery no more, but I lay all the tenth day in the close darkness, buried among coals and firewood, not daring even to crawl out for the drink for which I craved. It was the eleventh day before I ventured so far from my security. V. The Stillness My first act before I went into the pantry was to fasten a door between the kitchen and the scullery. But the pantry was empty, every scrap of food had gone. Apparently, the Martian had taken it all on the previous day. At that discovery I despaired for the first time. I took no food, or no drink either, on the eleventh or the twelfth day. At first my mouth and throat were parched and my strength ebbed sensibly. I sat about in the darkness of the scullery in a state of despondent wretchedness. My mind ran on eating. I thought I had become deaf, for the noises of movement I had been accustomed to hear from the pit had ceased absolutely. I did not feel strong enough to crawl noiselessly to the peephole or I would have gone there. On the twelfth day my throat was so painful that Taking the chance of alarming the Martians, I attacked a creaking rainwater pump that stood by the sink and got a couple of glassfuls of blackened and tainted rainwater. I was greatly refreshed by this and emboldened by the fact that no inquiring tentacle followed the noise of my pumping. During these days, in a rambling, inconclusive way, I thought much of the curate and of the manner of his death. On the thirteenth day I drank some more water and dozed and thought disjointedly of eating and of vague impossible plans of escape. Whenever I dozed I dreamt of horrible phantasms, of the death of the curate 
or of sumptuous dinners, but, asleep or awake, I felt a keen pain that urged me to drink again and again. The light that came into the scullery was no longer gray, but red. To my disordered imagination it seemed the color of blood. On the fourteenth day I went into the kitchen and I was surprised to find that the fronds of the red wheat had grown right across the hole in the wall, turning the half-light of the place into a crimson-colored obscurity. It was early on the fifteenth day that I heard a curious, familiar sequence of sounds in the kitchen and, listening, identified it as the snuffing and scratching of a dog. Going into the kitchen, I saw a dog's nose peering in through a break among the ruddy fronds. This greatly surprised me. At the scent of me he barked shortly. I thought if I could induce him to come into the place quietly I should be able, perhaps, to kill and eat him, and in any case it would be advisable to kill him lest his actions attracted the attention of the Martians. I crept forward, saying good dog very softly, but he suddenly withdrew his head and disappeared. I listened. I was not deaf, but certainly the pit was still. I heard a sound like the flutter of a bird's wings and a horse croaking, but that was all. For a long while I lay close to the peephole, but not daring to move aside the red plants that obscured it. Once or twice I heard a faint pitter-patter like the feet of the dog going hither and thither on the sand far below me, and there were more bird-like sounds, but that was all. At length, encouraged by the silence, I looked out. Except in the corner, where a multitude of crows hopped and fought over the skeletons of the dead the Martians had consumed, there was not a living thing in the pit. I stared about me scarcely believing my eyes. All the machinery had gone. Save for the big mound of grayish blue powder in one corner, certain bars of aluminium in another, the black birds, and the skeletons of the killed, the place was merely an empty circular pit in the sand. Slowly, I thrust myself out through the red weed and stood upon the mound of rubble. I could see in any direction save behind me to the north and neither Martians nor sign of Martians were to be seen. The pit dropped surely from my feet, but a little way along the rubbish afforded a practicable slope to the summit of the ruins. My chance of escape had come. I began to tremble. I hesitated for some time and then, in a gust of desperate resolution and with a heart that throbbed violently, I scrambled to the top of the mound in which I had been buried so long. I looked about again. To the northward, too, no Martian was visible. When I had last seen this part of Sheen in the daylight it had been a straggling street of comfortable white and red houses interspersed with abundant shady trees. Now I stood on a mound of smashed brickwork, clay, and gravel over which spread a multitude of red cactus-shaped plants, knee-high, without a solitary terrestrial growth to dispute their footing. The trees near me were dead and brown, but further a network of red threads scaled the still living stems. The neighboring houses had all been wrecked, but none had been burned, their walls stood, sometimes to the second story, with smashed windows and shattered doors. The red we grew tumultuously in their roofless rooms. Below me was the great pit, with the crows struggling for its refuse. A number of other birds hopped about among the ruins. Far away I saw gaunt cats slink crouchingly along a wall, but traces of men there were none. The day seemed, by contrast with my recent confinement, dazzlingly bright, the sky a glowing blue. A gentle breeze kept the red weed that covered every scrap of unoccupied ground gently swaying. And oh, the sweetness of the air, sixth of the work of fifteen days. For some time I stood tottering on the mound regardless of my safety. 
Within that noisome den from which I had emerged, I had thought with a narrow intensity only of our immediate security. I had not realized what had been happening to the world, had not anticipated this startling vision of unfamiliar things. I had expected to see Sheen in ruins. I found about me the landscape, weird and lurid, of another planet. For that moment I touched an emotion beyond the common range of men, yet one that the poor brutes we dominate know only too well. I felt as a rabbit might feel returning to his burrow and suddenly confronted by the work of a dozen busy navvies digging the foundations of a house. I felt the first inkling of a thing that presently grew quite clear in my mind that oppressed me for many days, a sense of dethronement, a persuasion that I was no longer a master, but an animal among the animals, under the Martian heel. With us it would be as with them, to lurk and watch, to run and hide, the fear and empire of man had passed away. But so soon as this strangeness had been realized it passed, and my dominant motive became the hunger of my long and dismal fast. In the direction away from the pit I saw, beyond a red covered wall, a patch of garden ground unburied. This gave me a hint, and I went knee deep, and sometimes neck deep, in the red wheat. The density of the wheat gave me a reassuring sense of hiding. The wall was some six feet high, and when I attempted to clamber it I found I could not lift my feet to the crest. So I went along by the side of it, and came to a corner in a rockwork that enabled me to get to the top and tumble into the garden I coveted. Here I found some young onions, a couple of gladiolus bulbs, and a quantity of immature carrots, all of which I secured, and, scrambling over a ruined wall, went on my way through scarlet and crimson trees towards Q. It was like walking through an avenue of gigantic blood drops, possessed with two ideas, to get more food, and to limp, as soon and as far as my strength permitted, out of this accursed unearthly region of the pit. Some way farther, in a grassy place, was a group of mushrooms which also I devoured, and then I came upon a brown sheet of flowing shallow water where meadows used to be. These fragments of nourishment served only to whet my hunger. At first I was surprised at this flood in a hot, dry summer, but afterwards I discovered that it was caused by the tropical exuberance of the red wheat. Directly this extraordinary growth encountered water, it straightway became gigantic and of unparalleled fecundity. Its seeds were simply poured down into the water of the way in Thames, and its swiftly growing and titanic water fronds speedily choked both those rivers. At Putney, as I afterwards saw, the bridge was almost lost in a tangle of this wheat, and at Richmond, too, the Thames water poured in a broad and shallow stream across the meadows of Hampton and Twickenham. As the water spread the wheat followed them until the ruined villas of the Thames Valley were for a time lost in this red swamp whose margin I explored and much of the desolation the Martians had caused was concealed. In the end, the red wheat succumbed almost as quickly as it had spread. A cankering disease, due, it is believed, to the action of certain bacteria, presently seized upon it. Now by the action of natural selection, all terrestrial plants have acquired a resisting power against bacterial diseases. They never succumb without a severe struggle, but the red wheat rotted like a thing already dead. The fronds became bleached and then shriveled and brittle. They broke off at the least touch, and the waters that had stimulated their early growth carried their last vestiges out to sea. My first act on coming to this water was, of course, to slake my thirst. I drank a great deal of it and, moved by an impulse, gnawed some fronds of red weed, but they were watery and had a sickly, metallic taste. I found the water was sufficiently shallow for me to wade securely, although the red wheat impeded my feet a little, but the flood evidently got deeper towards the river and I turned back to Mort Lake. 
I managed to make out the road by means of occasional ruins of its villas and fences and lamps, and so presently I got out of this spate and made my way to the hill going up towards Roehampton and came out on Putney Common. Here the scenery changed from the strange and unfamiliar to the wreckage of the familiar, patches of ground exhibited the devastation of a cyclone, and in a few score yards I would come upon perfectly undisturbed spaces, houses with their blinds trimly drawn and doors closed, as if they had been left for a day by the owners, or as if their inhabitants slept within. The red wheat was less abundant, the tall trees along the lane were free from the red creeper. I hunted for food among the trees, finding nothing, and I also raided a couple of silent houses, but they had already been broken into and ransacked. I rested for the remainder of the daylight in a shrubbery, being, in my enfeebled condition, too fatigued to push on. All this time I saw no human beings and no signs of the Martians. I encountered a couple of hungry-looking dogs, but both hurried circuitously away from the advances I made them. Near Roehampton I had seen two human skeletons, not bodies, but skeletons, pit clean, and in the wood by me I found the crushed and scattered bones of several cats and rabbits and the skull of a sheep. But though I gnawed parts of these in my mouth, there was nothing to be got from them. After sunset I struggled on along the road towards Putney, where I think the heat ray must have been used for some reason. And in the garden beyond Roehampton I got a quantity of immature potatoes, sufficient to stay my hunger. From this garden one looked down upon Putney in the river. The aspect of the place in the dusk was singularly desolate, blackened trees, blackened, desolate ruins, and down the hill the sheets of the flooded river, red tinged with the weed. And over all, silence. It filled me with indescribable terror to think how swiftly that desolating change had come. For a time I believed that mankind had been swept out of existence and that I stood there alone, the last man left alive. Hard by the top of Putney Hill I came upon another skeleton with the arms dislocated and removed several yards from the rest of the body. As I proceeded, I became more and more convinced that the extermination of mankind was, save for such stragglers as myself, already accomplished in this part of the world. The Martians, I thought, had gone on and left the country desolated, seeking food elsewhere. Perhaps even now they were destroying Berlin or Paris, or it might be they had gone northward. 